Okay, so let's start. Welcome everybody to this new session where we're going to talk about Kubernetes at the edge. So my name is Adrien Lev, I am professor at IMT Atlantic, a French engineering school, and I'm also leader of the Stack team. Uh, I am Karim Manawil, a PhD student within the Stack team. So what we are doing at the Stack Research Group, mainly we are working on the next generation of digitalized infrastructures, so namely cloud computing, fog, edge and behind and to give you an idea of the uh, infrastructure we are working on you can give a look to these uh, figures so on the top you can find the large data center that has cloud computing resources and then spread across the uh, internet you can find medium micro and nano data centers that uh, host computational and storage resources and you can also extend those micro and nano data center to the extreme edge, for example, where you can deploy such a, a small data center in a, a public transport, such as train or aircraft. So basically, uh, we try to solve two questions, how we can operate such a geodistributed infrastructures and how we can use such a, a, an infrastructure. So why we are there? Uh, during the last couple of years, we were uh, deeply involved in the OpenStack community, where we tried to uh, answer those questions uh, within the OpenStack framework. So we conduct two kinds of studies. The first one is related to OpenStack one wide. So basically the idea is that you deploy all control plane services of OpenStack in the cloud data centers. And then on each edge site, you deploy a remote compute node. Uh, basically you uh, deploy your Nova and Neutron agents. So to evaluate how OpenStack behave in such a scenario, we develop a, a, an open source tool which is called Enos that allow us to conduct experimental campaign of OpenStack uh, under such conditions. So basically we evaluated the scalability of OpenStack, the performance of OpenStack. We evaluated uh, uh, some alternatives in terms of communication bus, etc. So if you are interested by that, uh, I invite you to give a look to the FMDC SIG wiki page uh, on the OpenStack website. So uh, at the end of this uh, first studies, we uh, actually identify some trouble that uh, appear when uh, you face network disconnection. So basically, uh, you may lose some uh, remote compute node, uh, but uh, in the most critical case, when actually you face a disconnection between the control plane and the remote compute nodes, you can lost, uh, lose sorry, the whole infrastructure. So what does it mean? mean that actually, if you really want to deploy an edge infrastructure, autonomy matters. Each edge site should be able to satisfy local requests, whatever uh, uh, happen at the network level. So to this end, we investigate a second axis, where actually we try to uh, deploy multiple instances of OpenStack. So each uh, edge site now is fully independent, and we extend the OpenStack uh, CLI in order to uh, allow uh, those instances uh, to make uh, collaboration on demand. So I'm not going to dive into details. Uh, once again, if you're interested, uh, you can give a look to the uh, presentation uh, you can see at the bottom of that slide. But the main idea is to uh, uh, explicitly define which service of which site you are going to use to satisfy one request. So for example, if you want to start a VM on Berlin using the glance from Denver, you just have to specify that inside the request. The same if you want to uh, get the list of VMs that run in Berlin and Denver, you can also use a combinator. So what we present today, uh, basically since now six months, we start uh, similar uh, studies, but on Kubernetes. Uh, our idea is to see in a similar way uh, as we did for OpenStack, how Kubernetes behave in such context. So today we are going to present uh, the preliminary results we uh, uh, observe uh, when uh, running Kubernetes at one wide. Uh, and then we also discuss possible alternatives uh, that are available uh, nowadays in the uh, Kubernetes ecosystem. So for the ones that are not familiar with Kubernetes, uh, basically it's a system for running and coordinating uh, containerized applications, so namely the pods. It's a REST-based uh, master-slave architectures. And it has been designed to deploy control pane and workers on the same DC. 
So what does it mean? It means that basically all contrapane services and the worker that host the pods are connected to a high performance network switch. So what does it mean? It means that no latency, uh, negligible packet loss, uh, no network disconnection. So some conditions that actually are not available in a hedge scenario. So the goal of uh, this uh, uh, experimental campaign was to evaluate what is the impact of wider network links on Kubernetes. So to this M, uh, we consider the following scenario where we keep all control plane services of Kubernetes on one master site. So in this example, Paris, and we deploy several worker nodes remotely on different edge locations. So in this example, Madrid, London, and Berlin. And the question we try to answer is that how this latency can impact the creation of pod? Uh, is there any issue related uh, to the consistency of the cluster states? Uh, are there other services that might be affected by the latency? And typically, that's the question we are going to, 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 to solve uh, within this presentation. To answer, sorry. So to conduct our experiment, we uh, deploy uh, our evaluation on Glyph 5000 uh, using a similar tools we develop, and which is also open source uh, based on Kubernetes. And the scenario we uh, consider is a deployment composed of 100 nodes, one for the single master and 99 workers. And we uh, increase the latency from one millisecond between the master and the workers to 400 milliseconds. For the benchmark, we use cluster loader uh, that enable us to uh, stress our infrastructure by creating uh, pods, namespace, and so on. So regarding the metrics we collect, uh, Kubernetes uh, come with uh, its own monitoring framework, leveraging Prometheus. So by default, you have several metrics, such as the API request duration. But unfortunately, there is no metrics that enable us to really capture the impact of the latency. So to this M, uh, we had to uh, uh, revise a bit uh, the Go clients to uh, capture the record duration for every component. So basically, each time one component uh, inside Kubernetes uh, perform a request, we capture uh, this timestamp. And then when we receive the uh, answer, we just make the difference and we have the duration of the request. Um, so with this experimental protocol with Enhance, we did an evaluation for um, Kubernetes. And we start with pod startup latency. We briefly give um, an overview of how pod startup works in Kubernetes. Uh, so it is divided into three phases. We did this so that we can have a better observability. And if there are any problems, we can know where they are originating from. Uh, so it all starts, so there are three phases, create a schedule, schedule to run, run to watch. So for the creative schedule, it all starts by the user submitting the object to the IPI server. The IPI server persists the objects in its CD, and at that moment, the scheduler will uh, fetch the object and tries to schedule it on a working node, and then um, sends back that object to the IPI server for persistency again. And then um, this moment, we can say that the pod is scheduled, and we can move to the second phase where the kubelet gets that same object and, and starts it by uh, preparing the environment and, uh, and running the, um, and the containers of the pods. Um, so then uh, the kubelet will eventually send back a status to the IPI server reporting that the pod is now in the runnable state, which represents the last phase. So uh, theoretically, um, if there is a problem, it should be in the two last phases because it's here where we do uh, communication that are affected by latency. So uh, those are the results. We, uh, we, did the, we, we run the, the benchmark and then we, um, we gathered the pod startup latency. And we can see that the created schedule phase is not affected at all because basically that's clear because the, all the communications happens only between components on the master plan. Uh, however, for the two other phases, we can clearly see that they are affected by latency. Uh, run to watch is uh, a little bit less affected because uh, it only encompasses the status update and its delivery. So there is one round of communication with the IPI server. However, for the schedule to run, it is more affected because 
uh, it encapsulates a more complex logic uh, for preparing the pods and then starting them, uh, com communicating with the, um, with the container runtime, but eventually it might also involve multiple runs of communication with the API server to uh, fetch config maps or secrets to, for, um, for, for the container that are needed for the container. Uh, so basically this is what we were expecting, but the real question is, uh, is this, uh, is this delay in, in, uh, in processing the request is only caused by latency? Are there any other major errors? And what is the, the, um, what is the amount of degradation re in requests? So for this reason, we have measured the uh, IPI request latency uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the cluster. And uh, we got those two graphs. Basically, the, the, the graph or the upper graph shows the master request, late, the, the, the latency of the requests that are issued uh, on master components. And we show that they are not affected by any kind of behavior that may relate to latency, uh, which is something we are expecting. Uh, for the workers, uh, it, actually the requests take at least, but not so much from the round trip time duration. Uh, they are not really uh, degrading in a horrible way. So this is what we were expecting basically. No errors, request retries were observed. And that was actually a great result for Kubernetes. Um, but basically, uh, we can see that it is actually doing great for our pod startup latency. Now let's move to service discovery and see what's going to happen. Um, so in, uh, I, I start with give, by giving a brief um, overview of how, of how um, uh, service discovery works in Kubernetes or DNS. Uh, so we have pods uh, with their IP addresses, but we want to expose them with uh, a service uh, name. So for this reason, we use a service object in Kubernetes. Um, we give a name for our pods. And then uh, Kubernetes will assign it a virtual IP address. In this case, it's 10.0.0.90 in the example. Uh, once we, once the object is, the service object is created, the, the core DNS or the DNS server of the uh, Kubernetes cluster will observe that and will fetch this object and create um, the, the corresponding DNS records that will eventually resolve this name to its virtual IP address. And uh, at the same time, in, in, uh, in, in phase four, the, the Kube proxies will also fetch that service object and they will inject Linux kernel rules, networking rules that, uh, that, that will make sure to forward traffic uh, to, the, um, to, to the backend parts of the service when, when requests are sent to the virtual IP address. Uh, so now for, uh, for the pods that are running on the cluster, they will eventually um, communicate with the pods using their name. In this case, it's svc.cluster.org. Uh, so basically, the, the, the service will ask the core DNS to translate the name. It's going to retain the virtual IP of the service, and then the, the client will start communicating with that virtual address, and the request will all be forwarded to the backend pod. So this is how it works. Um, basically, we had an experiment. We deployed Nginx server and the client on the same air site, and we iteratively sent HTTP request. Uh, so the hypothesis is that the communication between the services located on the same site should not be affected late by latency. And, and this is actually the, the main reason we, why we decided to put them on the same site to, to reduce the, the, uh, the communication latency. Uh, so uh, it was actually paradoxical because we have observed two distinct collections of, um, of latencies in, uh, in the one wide uh, case uh, where we uh, we had the 50 milliseconds latency between the master and the workers. So few requests took 1.5 milliseconds, but other requests took about 101 milliseconds. So it is not supposed to be done like this. They are on the same side. They should not be affected by latency. So we want to understand the reason why uh, we have a set of um, a set of facts that will eventually lead to the to, to the reason. Basically, kubectl deploys core DNS as a replica set on the cluster, and uh, the deployment is tainted. And core DNS can be scheduled on the master. Uh, so um, so basically, there is now a replica on the master, a replica on the edge and the edge side, and core DNS itself is exposed as a service with a virtual IP address, and the nodes or the pods will eventually get load balanced. The requests will get load balanced to one of the replicas. So with this in mind, and since there is no DNS record caching within the pods, we can understand the reason why it happened, uh, we, why we observed those collections of points. So basically a few requests will go to the replica set on the edge side, but others will eventually uh, forward it to the replica set on the master, which is 15 milliseconds away. So with a round trip time, we get 100 milliseconds, and one millisecond for the processing of the request. 
Uh, so with this, we can, we can actually learn some lessons. Basically with the first experiment, we can see like Kubernetes can manage pods one wide without any critical issues. Um, but uh, as long as connectivity to the master can be maintained, because otherwise we will have a single point. We might have single point of failure issues with the master, with the single master. Uh, for the second experiment, uh, we, can actually, we can actually say that Kubernetes might be um, okay to be deployed in energy infrastructure, but it has to be done with care because uh, some unexpected behavior such as the DNS one can be seen and maybe in other services also that we haven't, um, you know, we haven't uh, measured. Uh, so the conclusion is that the centralized control plan seems to be a good solution for some use cases. But now the real question is that, are there any alternatives in particular to satisfy the expected autonomy of edge site? Um, so with autonomy, we, we want to say that um, the, the edge site is self-contained, um, the master, the workers, um, are on the same side, and uh, we don't have partition problems and uh, disconnection between the master and the, and the workers. Uh, so for the alternatives, um, we start with KubeFed, which is, um, which is facilitating uh, multi-cluster federation. Uh, it's, uh, it's implemented as a centralized server that distributes and propagates objects. As an, it's also implemented as a, an IPI extension. Basically, this is how you do a deployment in KubeFed. Uh, there is a, a federated deployment, and then eventually the Kube Federation will create two objects and then will submit each deployment object to each cluster independently. Uh, maybe the most interesting feature in KubeFed is, is, uh, is autonomy, uh, and, but it still has some problems. Basically, there's no communication cooperation between the clusters to, for, dynamic, for dynamically improving um, resource management and resource sharing. And there is also this, um, this downside of functionalities uh, being re-implemented on the federation control plans such as scheduling. Uh, Cube Edge is also an interesting solution. Uh, it is uh, mainly made for, maybe the most interesting feature is device management for IoT, but this is out of our scope. We're interested in giant distribution and mitigating its effects. Uh, and and in, this, um, in this regard, it, Cube Edge equips the nodes with a, uh, with a local SQLite uh, database for caching objects. Uh, so now we don't have to communicate with the, IP, the master and fetch objects each time we need them. Uh, they can be in the cache. Uh, now, but now we need to synchronize the, the local cache with the central ECD. And for this reason, we need an asynchronous bidirectional communication so that changes on ECD can be pushed dynamically to, uh, to the SQLite. Uh, it also uh, supports lightweight communication based on the quiz protocol. But, you know, um, conceptually, Cube Edge is the same as central Kubernetes. It has the same limitations, namely single point of failure and other behaviors such as DNS. Uh, Submariner is another solution. It might not directly relate to the edge, but it's an interesting solution towards peer-to-peer -to -peer and resource sharing between clusters on the edge for better resource management. Uh, uh, basically, pods and services of each cluster can be directly reached by other services through VPN connections, for, uh, by other clusters through VPN connections. It has a central broker which stores all the information required to set up the inter-cluster connectivity, but it still has, uh, but it's still only limited on networking. And also the broker might be a scalability issue, uh, but also a single point uh, of failure. So those are the main interesting initiatives. Now I, uh, I give the floor to Adrian. So what is the takeaway of uh, this presentation today? So basically we uh, first uh, address uh, the question of uh, evaluating Kubernetes uh, at one wide scale. Uh, as Karim uh, said, at first sight, it runs quite well. But it's really important to keep in mind that uh, you may uh, have side effects such as the DNS, and maybe some other services can also be impacted. So if we looked uh, a bit into what we did uh, within OpenStack, actually we also discover similar issue, in particular with Neutron and with the DVR features. So what is the general idea? That maybe for some use cases using Kubernetes as it is, and just configuring the different parameters, the different services in the correct way can satisfy a few use cases. Uh, 
there are two other points that we uh, do not address uh, today, but that probably makes sense to study. Uh, the first one is related to the management of the container images. So basically, what does it mean to uh, deploy many container images on different edge sites? How we can take into account the network characteristics? So that the first point and the second point is related to a single point of failure issue of the centralized control plane. So maybe here also we can find some counter measures such as uh, using replication strategy. But from uh, our point of view, we're a bit skeptical with such uh, uh, approaches, in particular due to the limitation in terms of scalability and the issue related to the network partition. So based on that conclusions, we uh, started to investigate uh, a few alternatives. So uh, we highlight today uh, the major ones. So the first one was related to KubeFed. Uh, so at the first sight, uh, it looks quite okay, but unfortunately there are important limitations. So in addition to having, uh, um, in addition to, to re-implement different mechanisms at the federated control planes, there is no collaboration between instances. So what does it mean? It means that uh, uh, if you uh, deploy a workload between two edge sites, uh, the components that are deployed on one edge site are not aware of the uh, other components that are deployed on other edge sites. So this is an important issue. So uh, regarding Cube Edge, it's probably a, a promising solution, uh, in particular, as we believe, uh, as I'm going to uh, uh, illustrate in the next slide, we believe that the, 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 the right solution will be basically a mix between some Kubernetes one wide and some Kubernetes instances that are completely independent. So in that con in that sense, we, we uh, introduced today Submariner, which is quite interesting from the collaboration viewpoint because this is the first project that actually um, provides some east-west communication between the different control plane in order to share some information. So in that direction, what are the next steps for our research group? So basically we want to uh, investigate a more decentralized models uh, as we did for OID. So as I said, we believe that it will be a mix between some Kubernetes one whites, for example, typically to, to, to manage some really light device where actually you can run container, but why is, it doesn't make sense to deploy a full Kubernetes or there is no enough resource to run the, the full control plane uh, of Kubernetes. So basically we believe it will be an hybrid between such Kubernetes one wide deployment and some independent Kubernetes instances that will be in charge of managing the different edge sites. So our main idea is to leverage the OID proposal. We presented uh, uh, one year ago uh, during the Denver summit. Uh, our main idea will be uh, to offer abstraction and the right mechanisms to allow DevOps to deploy workload across multiple edge sites but also to create cross Kubernetes objects such as namespaces, uh, services, and all the, 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 the fundamental elements of Kubernetes. So with that, this is the end of our presentation. So thanks for your attention. And if you have questions, please feel free. We'll be happy to, to, to answer them.